being emotionally driven instead of conceptually directed, they seem to operate on the warm, fuzzy notion that if their desire to achieve a goal is great enough, that's all they need, just sheer desire. And never having made it a policy to check for inappropriate mental habits, they semi-consciously resort to the unchecked, unchallenged notion, again, more is better. If stated in words, these people's basic attitude would be, I want big muscles so badly. If I persevere and go to the gym slavishly every day, eventually I have to succeed. After all, everything I've heard in the culture, everything I've read suggests that if I'm relentless, if I'm a slave to my art, through sheer dint of unrelenting effort, I will succeed. Which is, which is Arthur, or Arthur Arnold Schwarzenegger's favorite concrete bound concept. Just keep trying, just sweat, don't ever give up and eventually you'll succeed. You know how many people have failed with that idea? Every failure. Well, the joke is on them how pathetically wrong they are. As I indicated emphatically numerous times, just a while ago, it is the laws of nature that dictate the training causes that must be enacted to achieve your goals. Neither a wish, a whim, a hope, a dream, a wish, or desire is sufficient to cause a muscle mass increase. I don't care how special your mommy thinks you are, how long you pray to God at night, that is not enough to affect a buildup of muscle mass beyond normal levels. Neither is the application of a false idea or theory blindly accepted. I made the point a minute ago that man's physiologic nature, man's physiologic nature demands the imposition of a high intensity training stress as a first necessary cause, but that it is not sufficient cause to affect the desired result. One of man's specific physiologic characteristics dictates that the training stress must be cautiously regulated in terms of volume and frequency. It is his strictly limited recovery ability. The human being does not possess an infinite capacity for tolerating the exhaustive effects of intense physical stress. In fact, audience, and this is literally true, nothing in the universe is infinite, even the universe itself, including the biochemical reserve of resources that make up recovery ability. This fact is what led Arthur Jones to state, it is only rational to use that which exists in limited supply as economically as possible. Few of us would that a high intensity training stress is an absolute requirement for stimulating growth. The problem most people have, this is important, the problem most people have in fully accepting the theory of high intensity results directly from their failure to grasp the significance of the preceding statement by Arthur Jones. While the principle of intensity must be understood first as the requisite, as the first requisite, I'm sorry, for understanding anything else of value about exercise, the fact of a limited recovery ability, please write the word down, recovery ability, the second most important concept in exercise science after intensity. The fact of a limited recovery ability is the next key concept that must be grasped in the logically interdependent hierarchy of scientific knowledge and exercise physiology. It is only on the basis of knowing that the body has a limited recovery ability that one may understand why the volume and frequency of exercise must be cautiously regulated. Again, once you understand intensity, this is the second most important concept in the entirety of all of exercise science. I realize today, in fact, that the issue of recovery ability has never gained the full attention it deserves, which is why so many of you continue to chronically, grossly overtrain, 
and for that precise reason you fail to achieve your bodybuilding goals. In fact, think about it for a second, reflect for a moment. When was the last time any of you saw the term recovery ability used by the bodybuilding orthodoxy in any of those muscle magazines, magazines or comic books? As I have stated repeatedly in my books and articles, not only do these people fail to define any of their concepts, but their conceptual range is profoundly limited. They just don't have much knowledge. The average exercise scientist today doesn't even know what recovery ability is. The average exercise scientist today, being the lazy, dumb bastards they are literally, I don't say that with any slightest pause, because they deserve the title, they have never taken any time to do legitimate research, none of them. Not Dr. Kramer, not Dr. Fleck, none of these people have ever done any research. It's all made up. These are total phonies. They stole the idea of doing 60 sets a day from Weider because, as Kramer and Fleck said, that's how all the champions train. Well, that's real scientific. <clears throat> They totally ignore the issue of a limited recovery ability. All of you in here, I presume, have worked out at some point or another. When you're done working out after an hour or two, or even 30 minutes, aren't you tired? Well, that's obvious proof you have a limited recovery ability. But these guys say, no, that doesn't count. Well, they're real geniuses. In fact, it's curious, when I was a kid and saw the word, the, the thing, PhD, I was in awe. I thought, my God, these people are, are literally godlike. These are the few special people who spend their whole lives in the ivory tower, and they know everything about everything. Now I realize that the other old saying is true. PhD means piled high and deep in bullshit. And it's true. I've met maybe two PhDs in my life who literally deserved the title of a doctor of philosophy in his field. Remember, we live in an anti-rational culture. Do you think the field of exercise science would be exempt? No, I would think they'd be among the first to become stupid. The fact that, limited rec that recovery ability is strictly limited leads to a logically warranted conclusion. It is this that the issue of volume or number of sets, whether you do one set or hundred sets, the issue of volume, as I said earlier, is a negative factor, a negative influence period. Whether you do one set or a hundred sets, insofar that you do any sets at all, the issue of volume, I'm not speaking metaphorically here, the issue of volume in bodybuilding exercise science is a negative factor because for every set you perform, one set, two sets, three sets, for every successive set you perform, there is made a deeper and deeper inroad into the body's limited recovery ability, and that's a negative, let me explain. In order to understand the concept inroad audience, you might think of it as the term clearly suggests, visualize it, what's an inroad? An in into the road, a hole being dug. You do one set, you dig a small hole. You do a second set, you dig a deeper hole. A third set, even deeper. That's a negative thing because the deeper and deeper that hole gets, the deeper the inroad, then that much more of your recovery ability has to be wasted on filling the hole, or recovery we call it, leaving that much less left over for building the mountain on top, the muscle. But of course, you have to do at least one set to have a workout. Remember how I started this section on volume. I said the issue of volume is a negative factor, period, literally, even one set. But of course, you have to do at least one set to have a workout. Ideally, we could somehow figure out a way to stimulate growth with zero sets. That way, none of your body's recovery ability would be wasted on filling the hole recovery, it would all be used for overcompensation, building the mountain on top, and you'd grow so damn fast it would stagger the imagination. But of course, as of today, and I'm working on it, I haven't figured out yet how to stimulate growth with zero sets. 
On occasion, I have had a phone client ask the question, Mike, would it really make a difference? Hold on a second, I'm missing something here. As I was saying a second ago about the importance of these, this issue of recovery ability, it should be one of the two issues of most central concern, literally. The issue of recovery ability should be one of the two most important issues of central concern in exercise science, and they all but completely evade it. In one of the more recent issues of Flex magazine, one of Weider's top champs claimed to perform 45 total sets per workout, which of course amounts to chronic, gross, ridiculous overtraining, which can only be engaged in, by the way, with the help or mitigating influence of nightmarish quantities of steroids, growth hormones, and many of these new other drugs which I can't spell or haven't taken the time how to pronounce. Considering this, that Weider's top champs are only doing 45 sets, I find it rather interesting that the vaunted exercise size scientific establishment is now advocating that all, everybody, including you, the natural non-steroid bodybuilder, do 60 sets every day of the week. <clears throat> On occasion, I've had a phone client ask, Mike, would it make a difference? Would it really make a mistake to do a second set? you keep making such a big deal about doing one set. And I respond something to the effect that doing a second set is neither necessary nor desirable. In fact, it would be the biggest mistake you can make. Going from one set to two sets is literally the biggest mistake you can make because going from one to two audience is not merely a linear increase of one unit, one to two. It represents a doubling a 100% increase in the volume of the exercise. And remember, that's a negative. Even one set represents a negative because insofar that you train it all, you make an inroad. Well, some people might say, might say well, Mike, if I do a second set, maybe I'll, I'll get a little bit more growth stimulation. But then I point out, whatever little bit extra growth stimulation, you made a doubly deeper recovery ability, so that negates any greater growth stimulation. How do most bodybuilders train today? They go into the gym with the notion that their purpose is to see how many sets they can do or how long they can mindlessly endure. And that's wrong, of course, because bodybuilding is not aerobic. A bodybuilding workout is not an endurance contest. In fact, it used to be when I signed up new clients locally down at Venice, California, by the end of the first workout, my new client would look at his watch and he goes, but God, Mike, that was only 16 minutes. I feel like I can do more. And my stock reply would be, but sir, if I'm to take your statement at face value, I would have it you'd like me to train you until you can't do any more and you have to leave the gym in an ambulance. The point I'm underscoring here again, audience, is that your purpose as a bodybuilder is not to go into the gym to either prove or improve your endurance, but merely to stimulate growth with one set to failure. Now, if you don't like the standard of notation one, and I understand this, yes, I'd rather have $100 than $1 too, but we're not talking about economics here. If you don't like the number one in this context, Look at it this way. Let's say you're doing a set of 10 reps to failure on the pull-downs. You're doing the positive reps slowly under control, putting maximum stress. You're holding it statically for two or three seconds and then lowering for several seconds. On, do you see where each rep is actually made up of three units? The positive, the static, and the negative. Times 10 reps, you really did 30 units of work. If you don't want to call it one set, say, let's do 30 units of work. That'll make you feel a little better. Again, the point I want to make here, even if one extra set might contribute some slighter growth stimulation, which it won't, 
you also made a 100% greater inroad into recovery ability, making it that much harder to recover from the workout, let alone build the mountain on top of the muzzle. I want to discuss now the third fundamental principle of exercise science, ladies and gentlemen, the one relating to frequency of training. The single major cause of your failure to experience meaningful progress as a volume bodybuilder or possibly even a high intensity bodybuilder relates to overtraining. If you think I'm overstating it or I mention the issue of overtraining too often in my articles, you're mistaken. Considering that overtraining is the major cause of lack of progress, that most bodybuilders fail to achieve their goals because of it, and that the orthodoxy along with exercise science has unconscionably evaded the point, I'm actually understating the importance, the role of overtraining. Bodybuilding is not dying because of drug use, but because weeder and the powers that be continue to blindly promulgate the notion that volume overtraining is the best way to proceed while rarely informing you that their top champ take outrageous, even nightmarish quantities of drugs to help counteract overtraining. I find it curious that the great majority of bodybuilders, knowing that overtraining means something obviously, decidedly negative, never look into the issue seriously. Think about it, the term overtraining is always used in a negative context. In fact, try using it as a positive. Try using the term overtraining positive, you can't do it. By definition, overtraining means performing any more exercise in terms of both volume and frequency than is minimally or precisely required to stimulate growth. The majority of bodybuilders today still seem to operate on the notion that their purpose, as I said earlier, is to go into the gym to see how many sets they can do how long, how much they can take, or how long they can mindlessly endure. And that is wrong because, again, bodybuilding is not aerobic. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, a bodybuilding workout is not an endurance contest. Bear in mind that your actual, literal purpose as a bodybuilder is to go to the gym and intelligently, rationally, logically, knowingly do what nature requires merely to activate the growth mechanism then get the hell out, go home, rest, and grow. Many bodybuilders today apparently still don't understand that the big picture in bodybuilding is comprised essentially, I emphasize the word essentially. The in fact, you might write this down. I'm going to elaborate on this next crucial point for a few minutes, then we're going to go into an actual outline of a real training program. This is the last crucial point. Most bodybuilders today do not understand that the big picture is comprised essentially of two elements of equal value. I emphasize the word equal. By equal value, I mean literally 50-50, not 60-40, not 70-30, but 50-50. The first element, the first 50% of the big picture, obviously, yes, of course, is the actual workout. Who would deny that? But just as important, the other 50%, not one iota less important than the actual workout is the rest period between sets. And here's why. The workout, you must understand, does not actually produce, the word is produce, the workout does not produce muscular growth. Remember, the workout is merely what? A stimulus. It stimulates what? The body's growth mechanism into motion. It is the body itself that produces the growth, but only if you leave the body undisturbed by further exercise during a sufficient rest period. Or you could say it simply, in other words, if you don't rest enough, you don't grow enough, if at all. Now here's the crux of the problem. How does anybody know with reasonable certainty that enough time is elapsing, in fact, between workouts? The answer is to be found in the following. Immediately upon the workout, you don't feel the same as you did before the workout, do you? You're tired, exhausted. There's a deficit. It, 
In addition, just don't throw it at me. In addition to the personal experience of feeling fatigued, you have also exhausted in the technical sense a considerable portion of your body's resources or recovery ability, which were used to fuel the workout. Recall from earlier that the extent to which you work out or do a number of sets, you make what's called a what? An inroad, a key concept in exercise science. You make an inroad, you dig a hole into your recovery ability. The first thing your body must do after the workout is not grow, but what? Recover, fill the hole, overcome the inroad, the deficit, or as Arthur Jones used to like to say very eloquently, compensate for the exhaustive effects of the workout. Put back what was used up. Put back what was there before the workout. And here's the important point related to that. The process of recovery, overcoming the inroad, filling the hole, is not completed zippo in five minutes after the workout. <clears throat> in fact, the completion of the recovery process, the completion of the recovery process itself may take several days, a week, or longer, depending on the individual and his age, existing condition, the training stress, his nutritive equilibrium. It can take the body several days or longer to complete the recovery process before the body even has a chance to start building the mountain on top, which is overcompensating building the muscle. And if you train again before the recovery process is completed, you will short circuit the growth production process shy of 100 possible units. That's correct, the recovery process alone may take several days to be completed. And here's the proof. Every bodybuilder in here of any experience has had the experience of performing a tremendous leg workout, let's say on a Friday afternoon after work. And then after resting all weekend, you wake up on Monday and you're still generally fatigued. Your legs may feel more or less recovered but you still experience a sense of generalized or systemic fatigue, you know what I mean. One of the chief sources of confusion on the issue of frequency, this is very important, one of the chief sources of confusion on the issue of frequency is due to bodybuilders not realizing that exercise, in addition to having a localized effect on the muscle you're working, also has a systemic effect, a systemic effect. One must rest long enough between workouts to allow for localized muscle recovery like the legs or the arms, which again takes place actually rather quickly. But also you must allow enough time between, between workouts to allow for systemic recovery, which takes considerably longer. In fact, a good friend of mine, one of the guys who for my website, a very brilliant fellow, named Dave Staplin, who some of you may know, said one of the most intelligent things in this regard I ever heard. He said, Mike, we should not be prescribing rigid formulas for frequency. Each client should, should base his training frequency from his own progress chart. Let's say one workout, you go up phenomenally, 55 pounds on the deadlift. Obviously, there was a much greater stress on the body. Instead of waiting seven days, maybe wait 10 days to allow for the greater recovery necessity. If you now recognize that the rest period between workouts is just as important as the actual workout itself, if you accept that premise, that the rest period is just as important, and I assume most of you here do, do you see where it stands to reason that there must be a perfect or optimum number of days of rest between sets? Just like the number of sets to do. There has to be a perfect frequency, a perfect or optimum number of days of rest between sets. I and many other high intensity trainers have learned through enormous experience that for the vast majority, training once every five to seven to 10 or even less frequently is literally almost magic compared to any other protocol. Protocol. It is always a mistake to train two days in a row because two days in a row or 24 hours between workouts 
is not sufficient to allow for either full recovery or growth production. And no, absolutely not. Decompensation does not take place. Decompensation by the, you know what the term decompensation? We used to use the word atrophy or muscle loss, strength loss. <coughs> does not occur after six, 96 hours of no training. A number of years ago, I asked numerous bodybuilders, including some of the top ones like Dorian Yates, I said to them, hey, have you ever noticed that after a layoff of a week or even two or even longer sometimes that you always come back stronger? And they all responded in effect, you know, Mike, it's kind of odd that you bring that up, but you know, now, yes, that you're, you're making it a point, I always have the same experience. After a week or two or even longer off, I come back stronger. Well, if these individuals, if you come back stronger after a layoff, you didn't decompensate. You're stronger. You did the opposite. You overcompensated. So the point here is this. Do not worry. You will not decompensate after one to two weeks. So therefore, you're not going to decompensate after four days. Okay? That's really all I have to say on the issue of frequency. A few words to conclude this theoretical material, then I'll give you an actual training program to, to at least consider trying. What you have just heard, ladies and gentlemen, was not intended as an exhaustive treatise on the subject of exercise science more important of greater practical necessity is that what I just gave you provides a broad general discussion of the fundamentals again the term fundamentals of bodybuilding science an understanding of which is an absolute requirement for those seeking to lose their confusion and gain a logical perspective on the subject of productive bodybuilding exercise if you do not fully understand all the issues you heard today, then check your notes, read, reread them, and reread them, re reread -re -re them, and re 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 read them, as somebody once said to me, and I know I know why he emphasized that. Some people think if they read a particular subject and they don't get it on the first reading, you're somehow mentally lacking. That's not true. Even brilliant geniuses have to reread and re-reread and re-re-reread books over and over until they get it. <coughs> Where concepts are new, don't be afraid. Consult your best friend, the dictionary, and spiral with them. By that I mean connect these new ideas to other related ideas and experiences you have in your subconscious. Before long, you'll have a firm, thorough understanding such that you'll be able to move ahead as a rational, principled, logical bodybuilder and, a finally, and finally achieve the results you always believed impossible, but that you now know to be possible. The following is a concretization. The word is concretization. Everything you just heard was abstract theoretical material. Now we're going to bring all that abstract stuff down to the concrete, the in reality. The following is the ultimate consequence and final practical application of the abstract theory just described. It is the training program, a modified, improved version of the consolidation program listed in my book, Heavy Duty 2, Mind and Body. Many of you who have that book are keenly aware of the consolidation program suggested routine 2. What I'm about to outline for you is a new, improved version of the consolidation program. Before I outline the program, however, I'd like to give you a good idea as to what you might realistically expect in the way of progress. I'll recount the success stories of two of my local clients in Marina Del Rey, California. The first is a very nice young fellow named Andrew Tucker, who has a spe special visa to live in the U.S. from England. Andrew is an extremely intelligent young man who at the age of 22 is literally one of the handful of individuals in the world with considerable knowledge doing computer-generated animatography like they did in Jurassic Park. Just a little background material on Andrew. 
Andrew approached me some time ago complaining of being painfully thin, weighing only 163 pounds at six feet. I didn't think he was all that thin, but it did give him some psychological problems. With the program that I'm going to list for you today, where he did only two sets per workout once a week, Andrew is now up from 163 pounds to 210 and within four and a half months. And his deadlift went from 170 to 380 in the same period. Not long after Andrew signed with me, another young fellow, John Kulikoff, one of my favorite clients, approached me also complaining of being painfully thin, which in this case, he really was painfully thin. In fact, before his first workout, John and I sat down together alone to the side where he confided in me that for his entire life he suffered enormous psychological complexes being so thin. He had tried every type of program, the Weeder program with Metrex and the Cybex program with uh, the Weeders. Pro he tried everything you can imagine. Couldn't gain any muscle. He came to me and said, Mike, you're my last resort. He was so thin the type of guy you used to joke about in the locker room, you know, I hate to see this guy stand over the shower drain, we might lose him. He really was very thin. Within three months, using the program I'm going to list for you today, John went from 147 pounds at 6'1", until now he weighs just shy of 175, with his deadlift going from 165 to 345, and he's well on his way to his ultimate goal of 200 pounds. He will never again suffer the problems associated with being terribly thin and only training once every seven days for the past three and a half months. Now, make no mistake, what I just explained to you, these gains are not otherworldly. They represent the norm that to be expected when utilizing a properly conducted high-intensity training program. Of course, not every one of you in here will gain that well, although many will. Some of you will gain even more with a genetically bereft, perhaps not doing quite so well. For those of you who find stories such as these inspirational, you might check out my website at www.mikemenser.com. A number of these success stories have with them the phone numbers of the individuals listed so you can call them and check for authenticity. None of this is lies. If you know nothing about high intensity training and you hear it's possible to gain 25 pounds in three months and almost double your deadlift, it may sound impossible, but it's because you're ignorant at this point, but you don't have to remain ignorant. The following routine, the program you're here listed, is at least from one perspective, the literal perfect bodybuilding program. If you keep in mind this one thing, that the ideal situation is to be able to stimulate all of the major muscles of the body with the least amount of exercise possible, which is one set. Now, I'm not going to ask you to do but one set. Uh, let me explain. Bearing in mind all the while that, as I stated earlier, issue of volume, number of sets, is a negative factor period. Keep that in mind as you hear this. You will perform two different workouts referred to as workout A and workout B. You will do one workout a week. So if you start on a Saturday, for instance, it doesn't have to be a Saturday, with workout A, you wouldn't perform workout B until the next Saturday. And if a scheduling conflict arises, as often happens, don't go back to the, the sixth day. Don't reduce the frequency. Go to the eighth day. And after eight or, to eight or so total workouts, take two full weeks off, then resume training once every nine days. And for the following reason. In fact, this is the most important issue in exercise science once you have first understood what you heard earlier, the fundamentals of intensity, volume, and frequency. 
after eight or so total workouts, take two weeks off, then resume training once every nine days for the following reason. You will grow stronger as a result of every workout without a doubt unless you're extremely genetically hurting. You will grow stronger as a result of each workout. You will, in other words, audience, be lifting progressively heavier weights all the time. Do you see where it stands to reason, dear listeners, that as the weights grow progressively greater, then the stresses also grow progressively greater too? Does that make sense? If you don't do something to compensate, to compensate for the ever-growing stress, the stresses will reach a critical point such that they constitute overtraining. The first, of course, will be a slowdown in progress. And if you continue with the same exact volume and frequency protocol, there will ultimately be a complete cessation of progress known as a sticking point. I, like everyone else up until recently, used to believe that you had to reach a sticking point. It was inevitable. Until I realized what I just told you, that if you're lifting progressively heavier weights, then the stresses are growing greater. You've got to compensate for them or eventually the stresses reach a critical point and they constitute overtraining. This can be prevented by inserting extra rest days and taking layoffs. You should never have to reach a sticking point. In fact, how many of you have been reading the muscle magazines for a long time? How many articles have you seen in the last 20 years where they address the issue of sticking points at all? Not that many. They evade the subject because they have no slightest clue as to how to answer it. If I can honestly say I, I contributed one meaningful thing to exercise, it's what I just explained to you. That as you get stronger and bigger, you don't do more exercise, you do less. Because the stresses are growing greater. In other words, a beginner is too damn weak to overtrain. But as you grow bigger and stronger and you're handling 500 pound squats, you can overtrain very easily. So you don't train more as you grow bigger and stronger, you train less and you'll keep growing. All right, let's move to the workout. Workout A will consist of number one, a set of squats, preferably on a Smith machine, eight to 15 reps to failure. If you don't have a, a, a Smith machine, don't worry about it, just do regular old fashioned free weight squats. After that, take a brief rest, get a drink of water, let your breathing slow down. As soon as you clearly recognize you're ready to go, boom, you go to exercise number two, close grip, palms up, pull downs for six to 10 reps of failure. Now by close grip, I mean your grip should be about eight inches apart, your hands. Palms up, this is palms up, not palms down, like a barbell curl grip. Close grip, palms up, pull downs, six to 10 reps to failure or thereabouts. By the way, when I say eight to 15 for the squats or six to 10 for the pull downs, that's not a magic range or number. If you remember, the important thing is going to failure. If you get to 15 reps on the squat and you see you have 18, don't stop at 15. Remember the stimulus responsible for triggering growth is that last hard, almost impossible rep. Be sure to initiate this movement, the pull-downs, with extreme deliberation. There should be no sudden jerking, yanking, or thrusting to get the weight started and to keep it moving. Not super slow, but relatively slow. Not 10 seconds up and 10 seconds down. In fact, the keynote here is there's no magic number of seconds. The keynote is control. You want to lift the weight under full muscular control, momentarily in the contracted position or for two to three seconds and lower under control. I have, I have discovered recently through my own workouts that this usually translates into a four to four cadence, four seconds down, two seconds hold and four seconds up. But if you're off by 0.4 seconds or 1.2, don't worry about it too much. And that is all for workout A, just two sets of one exercise each. 
One week later, you'll perform workout B, which will consist of, number one, a set of regular, not stiff-legged or sumo, but regular old-fashioned power lift or deadlifts for five to eight reps of failure. Now, if there is one exercise I'd like to see you fall in love with, audience, it's this one. As the deadlift is properly regarded by most as the greatest overall strength and mass builder. However, there is a risk factor seen with the deadlift you don't see with a lot of other exercises. Listen carefully, please, I, as I explain proper form. Or did you do that? I would suggest you, if you can, if you're strong enough, use an Olympic bar with a 45-pound plate on each side so you don't have to bend over so damn far. Start with the bar rolled back flush against your shins. Start with the bar rolled back against your shins. Now this is a real important issue here. Remember, as a trainer, safety is my paramount concern. I'm not going to ask you to do dumbbell bench presses on a Swiss ball or heavy squats while jumping up and down on a trampoline like Pollockin would have you do. Grasp the bar with a slightly wider than shoulder width grip. Your hand should be interlocking. One hand is underhand, one hand is overhand. That way, if the bar slips either way, it slips into the other hand and it locks. Squat down in such a fashion that your hips or buttocks are at least slightly lower than your shoulders. And most important of all, keep your back flat and your head up. Keep your back flat and your head up at all times. Do not round your back or drop your head. Think of your, arm, of your arms. Visualize your arms as chains. They're straight up and down with hooks on the end of your hands. Deadlift the bar. Don't jerk the bar with your arms. Deadlift it evenly and smoothly off the ground. Stand straight up, pause momentarily, then rest. Then, I'm sorry, then lower and reset psychologically. Take a deep breath and repeat again five to eight reps of failure. After yeah. Yeah, you're pumped. It pumps the lower back. Yes, as long as you don't, if you experience any slightest tweaking or your doubt about the sensation, it might be pain. Check it out. Get it checked out. No, all the way down. You're less likely to hurt yourself. And again, as a trainer, if you want to do it that way, that's up to you. You're not going to be able to sue me anyway. Just, just momentarily, long enough to take a deep breath and reset. After the deadlifts, take a, a brief one or two minute rest, then proceed to dips. Regular parallel bar dips, just like you did back in high school gym class. Do the dips, like the pull-downs, under full strict muscular control for six to ten reps. If you can do more than ten reps, as I rather suspect most of you can do, add weight. I meant to emphasize the dip. Think of the dip as the upper body squat. You cannot beat it. It is the best pec exercise in the world, the best shoulder and tricep exercise. If you don't have access to one or you can't do dips, try incline presses. And that's all for workout B. Now, I have no doubt what some of you are thinking. That's it, Spencer, that's all. You gotta be fucking crazy. <laughs> well, remember, the goal is not to see how many sets you can mindlessly endure, but to intelligently, knowingly, rationally, logically do only what nature requires to activate the growth mechanism and no more. Yes, there are hundreds of exercises you could do, but where do you draw the line? Very often, when I tell a new phone consultation client to do this workout, he'll say, oh, but Mike, how about the leg curls for the hamstrings? No bent over dumbbell concentration curls like Arnold says for the lower outer 32nd of the bicep. How about seated calf raises for that special part of the calf? or this for that, that for this, on and on ad infinitum. And I respond rather firmly, but sir, that's precisely what the hell you were doing before, and that was your mistake. 
That's what led you to call for my phone services, whether you realize it or not. Your problem, I continue, is that you so burned yourself out with all those sets trying to build in the detail. Why don't you build a 20-inch arm first? You see the point. Yes, there's a thousand exercises you could do, but where do you draw the line? Remember, you're going into the gym just to activate the growth mechanism with the least amount of exercise possible. A bodybuilding workout is not aerobic. A bodybuilding workout is not an endurance contest. Your only purpose is to activate the growth mechanism with the least amount of exercise possible. Those success stories I listed 20 minutes ago are not fakes. And again, if you, if you doubt my veracity, check my website. We've got dozens of success stories on there with phone numbers. The one kid who, who one of the greatest success stories Bryce done last Sunday had 37 phone calls from people all over the world to check to see if I was lying about this. Yeah, I pay all these guys $10,000 to lie. I wish I was making enough money to afford that. Keep in mind also, of course, you're not morally, legally bound people to do this whole program the rest of your life. However, if optimal strength and size increases is your goal, then seriously consider trying this. I have no doubt that if, if those of you in here, you volunteer, you're not making any meaningful progress, if at all. You have nothing to lose to try this and everything to gain. Of the type of routine I'm giving you, there's, there, are, there are no isolation exercises involved here. This pro, again, I could have given you a hundred more exercises and statics and negatives and rest pause, but as your trainer, in a sense, my job initially is to get you to start growing. We can throw in the heavy art. Try this for three months first. This is a, I call this a baseline program. If you start throwing in all these other, these tangentials, and you were to call me for a phone consultation, I wouldn't know how to assess your progress. So I always start people out on this bare bones startup baseline program. <clears throat> I did say a few minutes ago that from at least certain perspectives, this program is the perfect strength or bodybuilding training program. If you keep in mind, once again, that the ideal situation is to stimulate all the major muscles of the body with the least amount of exercise possible. Well, again, I'm not asking you to do the least amount possible, which is one set. Interesting to note here, however, listen to this. I have a few clients doing but one set of workout. In fact, my best gaining client ever, literally, is a phone client, my greatest success trainer. His name is Will Robertson. He's got considerable publicity on the internet and he had an article, there was an article published about him with photos, what was it, about a year ago in Master Trainer. This young fellow, Will Robertson, is a very bright 21 year old with the greatest vocabulary I've ever seen with anyone that young, a brilliant young kid. He's an English literature major at the University of North Carolina. Here's the crucial point a bodybuilder who doubled, yes, doubled his physical mass in four years, going from 125 pounds at 5'6", to his high of 254 at 5'6", in four years. A few years ago, when Will first signed up with me as a phone client, he explained that he was having very severe psychological problems being so thin. Here's the kind of cute, not so cute point. Now at the other end of the spectrum, he informed me recently during a follow-up, he's having problems too. It seems that wherever he goes on campus, whether to the library to study, to the cafeteria for lunch, to classes, he is stopped all day long, incessantly, by teachers and students who are curious as to how he became so freakishly muscular. He just wasn't psychologically prepared for all the attention his enormous muscles would gain him. Anyway, to conclude, at this point in his training, Will is now only doing one set per workout and he's still growing. Let's return to the why. Why is this program that I'm, I just gave you, from one perspective again, perfect? Well, let's look at the pull-downs. While most people think of them exclusively as a lat exercise, and they are very good for the lats, they are also very effective in working the 
and it just so happens to be true audience the close grip palms up pull down is the best bicep exercise in the world better than any curl you can do here's why <clears throat> when you do a curl, whether it's a barbell curl, a nautilus curl, a dumbbell curl, whatever, you're working this muscle around a single joint axis, the elbow, which is why the stress is limited exclusively to the lower bicep, if you've noticed. When doing a grip palms up pull down, on the other hand, you're working the bicep around the joint, the elbow joint, and the shoulder. The muscle is contracting more uniformly from both ends. And the dips. Again, I said think of the dips as the upper body squat. Dips are by far, without a doubt, they're unparalleled. They are the best exercise for pecs, delts, and triceps. Did any of you happen to catch the, watch the Olympics from Atlanta a couple summers ago on sports? There were three Americans who worked the parallel bars, you may recall. Three American gymnasts who worked the parallel bars that possessed pecs, shoulders and arms like those of an advanced bodybuilder literally not just you know kind of beginning bodybuilders but advanced bodybuilders one of my recent phone clients happens to be deeply involved in the world of gymnastics and he knows those three he told me that people ask them all, all the time if they lift weights and they don't they develop those big upper bodies doing dips and then just last sunday i happened to tune in literally by accident to ABC Wide World of Sports and a gymnastics competition. At one point, they did a close-up of Ivan Ivanko. Have you ever heard of him? Incredibly heavily muscled guy. As he was, chalk, he was putting chalk on his hand for the, in preparation for the overhead horizontal bar where you do chin-ups mostly. As he supinated the palm of his right hand to put on the chalk, his bicep isolated and popped out it looked as big and even more defined as most advanced, even professional bodybuilders. The point here is that this program will stimulate strength and size increases in all of your major muscles. My suggestion is that you do the workout regimen for at least six months in order to maximize your body's anabolic process. Yes, I know there's a thousand exercises you could do, but you gotta draw the line somewhere at the least amount possible. A few final points on the program. Don't make the mistake of gauging or evaluating, evaluating the success of any one of these workouts based on pump or soreness. They are not important. If getting was clear, undeniable, irrefutable proof that growth was stimulated, then all those knuckleheads I see down at Gold's Gym in Venice were right down the street from my office. They're not all knuckleheads, some are in the process of learning, but these guys who continue to evade the truth and make the same mistake for 20 years are knuckleheads. These guys would have 39 inch arms by now because they've been getting pumped every day, twice a day, even three times a day for years. The pump obviously, of course, is only temporary. I like it myself, but you're lucky if it lasts only 20 minutes. The main point is this. You won't know that any one of these workouts was a successful workout until the next time you do that workout. That is an important point, by the way. You should want to know that every workout was a successful workout. I'm still amazed at how many people are willing to train months and literally even years and years with little or no progress. I personally will not tolerate one workout without lack of progress or with lack of progress. If I see there's no progress, I stop, analyze what I'm doing, and make the appropriate changes. As I tell my phone clients, look, there's a reason for everything in this world, including lack of bodybuilding progress, and the number of possible explanations is not infinite. Go to the fundamentals. Either you're training intentionally enough, and or you're doing too many sets and or too many workouts. There's no other possibility other than you might be suffering from some undiagnosed disease like AIDS or whatever. And that's a possibility in this day and age. If you are growing stronger every workout, obviously a positive change is taking place in your muscle. That's how you gauge the success of these workouts. Not by pump or soreness, but the next one.
worked out if you're stronger, didn't something positive happen? So the point here is keep a training journal. Record the date of each workout, list your body weight at the beginning, enumerate the exercises, list the amount of weight, and accurately record the number of reps, please, because even a one rep increase can be significant. You will grow stronger each and every workout from the program listed, and you will larger too, but only if you are obtaining adequate nutrition. Keep in mind the guiding principle, get a well-balanced diet. A well-balanced diet consists of 60% carbohydrates, 25% protein, and 15% fats. All these other ratios you've been reading about lately come from not reputable nutritional scientists, but food fattists and nutritional mythologists. A 60-25 bean is a well-balanced diet. You've heard of the four basic food groups cereals and grains, fruits and vegetables, meat, fish, poultry, milk. If you get your daily, con in fact, I just realized this six months ago, if you're getting a well-balanced diet, if you're obtaining your daily complement of the four basic food groups, you have a 60-25-15 ratio. Remember, muscle is not mostly protein, it's mostly water. Now look at the, look at the word carbohydrate. The suffix hydrate means water. As you probably all know, the carbohydrate stores in the muscle becomes a chain of sugar molecules called glycogen. And every gram of glycogen stored in the muscle chemically bonds with and holds three grams of water. When you go lower than 60% carbohydrates on a high intensity program, you're gonna burn the glycogen out of the muscle, not restore it, and the water that was chemically bonded will leave the muscle too and the muscle becomes flat flaccid and dehydrated. And if you stay on it long enough, you'll actually go into muscle catabolism. Your muscle will actually break down, go to the liver, and through a very complicated process called gluconogenesis, will turn your own body's protein into sugar. So sugar ain't the bogeyman has been made out to be. It should predominate in a well-balanced diet. You can optimize you can, you can make your recovery ability optimum for your own genetics by eating an adequate, well-balanced diet, but you can't, by stuffing in supplements and huge quantities of food, make it super great. No. There is no such thing as super nutrition, only optimum nutrition. Your body can only utilize so much nutrients. Any excess will either be excreted or turned to fat. All right, thank you very much again for coming out on a Saturday.